Welcome. Welcome to the official launch of Unicorn in the Woods, how East Coast geeks and dreamers are changing the game. Our guests this evening are the author, renowned business writer, Gordon Pitts, and Dr. Herb Emery, who currently holds the Vaughn Chair in Economics at the University of New Brunswick. My name is Suzanne Alexander. I'm the publisher of Goose Lane Editions, and I'll be your host for this evening's event. The, ev the event will begin with a short reading from Unicorn in the Woods by Gordon Pitts, followed by a live 20 minute conversation between the author and Dr. Emery. If you would like to ask a question of Gordon at the end of their conversation, please type it in the chat menu and Herb will ask the question on your behalf. Don't be hesitant, there'll be lots of time for questions and lots of opportunity. At the end of the evening, Nancy Mathis of the Wallace and Kane Institute and Karina Leblanc, Executive Director of the Fonde Center, both at the University of New Brunswick, will join us to announce a new In Conversation series resulting from the publication of Unicorn in the Woods. Our bookseller sponsor for this evening's event is Westminster Books of Fredericton. Should you wish to uh, order one of a limited number of autographed copies of Unicorn in the Woods, please contact Westminster via email at info at westminsterbooks.com or by telephone at 1-800-561-7323. Again, that's 1-800-561-7323. If, however, you're located outside of New Brunswick, you can obtain a copy of Unicorn in the Woods at your local bookstore or your favorite online bookseller. If you're in the US, books may be uh, purchased from Barnes and Noble or from amazon.com. And copies are also available at goosling.com and we never hesitate to, to actually take your order. Now for the main event. Gordon Pitts is a former senior writer for the Globe and Mail so report on business. He has had a long interest in economic issues. He's the author of seven books, including the national bestseller, The Codfathers, Lessons from the Atlantic Business Elite, and Stampede, The Rise of the West and Canada's New Power Elite, which won a National Business Book Award. In his new book, Unicorn in the Woods, Gordon Pitts returns to Atlantic Canada to look beyond the traditional business elites associated with the region. Looking for the elusive unicorn, he tells the stories of two remarkable companies, Q1 Labs and Radian 6 their rise, their successes, and their continuing but not so obvious legacies. And he asked the question, is there a place for high-tech innovation and unicorn-like value creation outside of major urban centers, whether in Atlantic Canada, Rust Belt, New York, or Northern Ontario? Here's Gordon to read a short excerpt from the beginning of Unicorn in the Woods. Thank you, Suzanne, very much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and. Uh, Definitely thanks to uh, my publisher for hosting this event. Uh, of course, I am reading from Unicorn in the Woods, uh, which is uh, um, has a pretty nifty cover, I must say. Too bad I, I don't think you get the full effect here. I'm going to read from the introduction, which I think uh, puts you, the whole book into context. Chris Newton didn't really expect much from the meeting. He would have been content to spend the day coding software in his tiny office along a dark corridor at the University of New Brunswick's computer science building in Fredericton. But officials of the university who were after all his employees had insisted he go to this gathering of alumni and potential investors in the hope of turning his little software idea into something commercial, something that actually might be sold. He didn't think he had a product uh, just a way of dealing with the denial of service attacks from uh, mischief makers that were wreaking havoc on the university's ill-prepared computer networks in these early days of the internet and the wired university. Massive quantities of data would slam into the UNB network and shut it down, inciting a chorus of complaints, creating urgent calls for a cybersecurity tool that could give real-time snapshot of the health and frailties of the system. And that was what Newton was working on. This program he called Simon, short form for system monitor. Mostly at home at night as he wrote computer code well into the wee small hours. But on that warm fall day in 2000, wearing shorts, sandals and a t-shirt, a 28 year old part-time student and full-time UNB employee lugged his laptop up the hillside from his tiny office 
through the cluster of UNBA signature red brick buildings towards the modernist U Conference building at the top of the hill. Below him lay the sleepy provincial capital with its 19th century legislature, its sprawling frame mansions, and the broad St. John River as it curled downriver um, from, uh, from its source in northern Maine. A crowd of interested types had gathered in the meeting room, creating the impression of a pilot for the future TV series, Dragon's Den. At his appointed time, Newton flipped open his laptop and a chart appeared, a color guide to the maze of computer networks that coursed through the university, where the emails went, where the downloads landed, and where the trouble points were flaring up. There was a silence and then a large dark haired man moved closer to the front and fixed his attention on the screen. Then started peppering Newton with questions. What is this thing? Could it be sold? Who owned it? Can we talk? Chris Newton was polite. He was the compactly built baby faced son of a police chief in the Miramichi, the rugged Northeast New Brunswick region of salmon forests and old mill sites. The only presenter under the age of 40, the only non-academic in the group, he projected boyish innocence and showed proper respect to people. He found the whole thing unsettling and intriguing. Newton finally managed to tear himself away and scrambled back down the hill to his office in the comfortable corridors of the UNB Computing Center. But the big, intensely energetic man would show up later, talking on about forming a company, creating a product, becoming an entrepreneur. Chris Newton didn't know what an entrepreneur was, or a startup, or a business model, or venture capital. He just liked fixing things, figuring things out, solving problems with the people who employed him. But his relentless uh, pursuer was obsessed with all these things. With the rangy build of an athlete, Brian Flood towered over Chris Newton. He was more than a decade older and a hundred times more experienced in the ways of the business world. Flood was like a man possessed, having spent the past four years preparing for this moment this moment when he could seize the chance for funding a technology breakthrough in his beleaguered home province. He didn't seem like a tech founder. He had been running a sports bar down the road in Moncton, later added another one in his hometown of St. John, both cities about an hour or two his drive from Fredericton. Then he got hooked about this on this hot new thing called the internet. He embarked on a personal crash course to learn about this new pot of gold that entranced everyone from Bill Gates and Steve Jobs to callow kids such as Mark Zuckerberg, who is still just a student at a New England private school, but about to burst onto the world as a social networking Harvard undergrad. Flood was just back from a fact-finding expedition, one of his fact-finding expeditions to the Silicon Valley in California, when he was invited to this showcase event. He had first met Newton in the rubber room, a session where the presenters were prepped for the show. Chris Newton seemed like the answer to his dreams, a whiff, a whiff of game-changing innovation in the middle of his home province. As he chased Newton around the Hillside University, he acted like a suddenly smitten suitor, pursuing the reluctant target of his affections. He was not going to let this slip away. In the words of one friend, Brian Flood is the weirdest, wackiest, hardest working, most tenacious son of a bitch. At one point in the courtship, Flood asked, almost as a throwaway line, what would IBM pay for it? Chris Newton said, oh, you know, they might pay maybe $25 a month for using the software, or if we really got good, it could be $500 a month. Neither imagined a decade later, IBM would pay 600 billion dollars for this technology and the company that had developed it. For Chris Newton's little product. And that Chris Newton would have already gone on to co-found another company he and his colleagues would have sold for about $330 million US. The bashful kid from the Miramichi would be New Brunswick's billion dollar man in value creation, putting him in the same rarefied air as the Irvings, Olin's, McCain's, Sobeys, and other established business families whose names are synonymous with wealth, power, and achievement on Canada's East Coast. Thank you. Hi, Herb. Thanks, Gordon. That was terrific. <clears throat> As you know, I'm a 
big fan of the book and have enjoyed reading it, which is a nice setup for asking some of those tough probing questions to uh, drum up interest. So one view I have on these kinds of books is that the appeal of them is that people read them as sort of a how-to manual or some kind of recipe book that if I read this story, I'll understand what I need to do in Thunder Bay to get a unicorn to show up there. And there's a number of questions in the book that you address, like, is it repeatable? What were the circumstances? And not to give away too much of that, I wanted to reframe the question slightly differently, which is, you must have taken some lessons from putting the story together. And if you had advice for a local development agency, a provincial government, a university that was interested in getting this space, what are one or two key things that they should be thinking about if they want to create the conditions for a unicorn? And what are one or two things that they have to stop doing? If you have any thoughts on those kinds of uh, directions that you could advise. Well, I think you could start off maybe with uh, um, not being too prescriptive, actually. Um, and not, you know, a lot of, uh, I think, uh, organization, a lot of small startups get caught up in trying to meet uh, organizations' expectations in terms of a, a perfect prescription for a startup. It, it does, doesn't happen that way. There's a, and I think if you take one of the lessons away from this, there's an alchemy and a kind of wealth creation that, that's really quite magical. It comes together with a set of circumstances and it can be quite fluky. But for to move beyond the fluke to something sustainable, you do have, a, have to have a number of conditions. And I think, you know, obviously the support of government it's great to have a strong institutional support, including a, uh, a university or a college uh, with uh, not only um, research capabilities, but uh, the ability to bring people together um, to create the kind of um, serendipity that uh, you need with these situations. And I think one of the things I got out of here is the fact that I want to emphasize this. These folks who founded Q1 Labs in particular, which was one of the two, did not actually graduate from UNB. I'm, I hate to say that. In fact, um, but they learned a lot there, obviously, and they gained from it. So I think that's a big lesson to universities is that often the innovation is not necessarily even in the grad students and academics, although they are a huge part of it. But it can be in the that woman, that man who's working as a staff person in the computing science center, or um, you know, or it could be we could be talking about any organization, whether government organization or corporate. It's not it. Innovation comes in strange packages and found in strange places, and not necessarily in the predictable places. So you have to have a supportive network ready when that innovation occurs. So one dimension. This gets back to. I'm really glad you read your section about Brian Flood, who really is a an amazing character. I think he could have been an entire book on his own. Yeah. But the uh, one of the the things that's interesting is a lacking element in the maritime region, especially now, is business university partnership. And an amazing part of the story in that respect is where the collision between Newton and um, and flood took place. And are we thinking enough about how business capital is interacting with the people with the ideas? What's the incubator or the facilitator that's bringing them together? And I'm a bit curious now how that could work because it seems like the UNB that you described was a little more freewheeling a decade ago. Well, I can't comment on the um, UNB then to now. I think some of the people are the same and I think uh, you have to look at uh, a person like David Ford, who uh, who brought Chris Newton, uh, there are there are uh, there are matchmakers. There are people who create these events, and uh, David was instrumental. I think you have to create the um, setting uh, that the money can meet the ideas, and um, it's a much more developed world though in Atlantic Canada generally now than it was uh, 20 years ago. I think we have a lot of institutions. Uh, that, that have stepped up. We, we even have the Creative Destruction Labs. Uh, we have even uh, Planet Hatch, and that's kind of, which must create a kind of chemistry. So that's been one of the great achievements of Q1 Labs and Radiant 6. You have the Wallace McCain Institute, and you have, you have all, all kinds of, 
and they, and they meet the needs of different points in the life cycle of companies. So I wouldn't be too down on it. I think there's a lot going on, um, but you need the connectors. You need the people with the energy and the and the drive, and who can see um, the need to create these opportunities and then connect them to the money to bring the money into. And honestly, I'll say I'll maybe I'm moving the conversation ahead a bit. There are some challenges now in the COVID. Uh, face to face is was such an important part of of that chemistry that created them. Uh, um, would it have been different if Brian hadn't sized up Chris? If they if they if Brian hadn't chased Chris around the university for a while until they wore Chris out? You know that's the kind of that's the kind of thing we're going to have to to recreate uh, after the COVID period. And the role of the university is key, and I worry about that a little bit too. Um, in the uh, uh, when do we get back to a residential structure? When do international students, um, uh, which are a big part of the book, uh, particularly in the post Q1 labs period? So it's interesting you bring, I'll pivot a bit to the COVID because one of the views of an advantage now of New Brunswick and the Maritimes is that because we're relatively COVID free and we're breaking the bonds of workplaces and physical locations. There's also a view now that without the face-to-face -face requirement, maybe we have an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so maybe in the book, there's some lessons about what are the dimensions we should be pushing on to take advantage of that. And again, maybe the innovation has to come through the sales and marketing and meeting dimensions. Maybe that's the space we should be thinking about. Uh, but again, it the book sort of, it's interesting to follow the narrative of what the players have been doing since the exits in uh, 2010, 2011, where they're playing now. Uh, but also you had some nice sections on uh, new players who are coming into the marketplace. But again, we get this sort of tantalizing, we've got the seeds that are kind of there, we're sort of waiting. But then there was this other curious dimension that a lot of the value seems to be captured of late in Nova Scotia that you uh, had mm -hmm. some key players in there, and which makes me think New Brunswick might be too narrow a focus. Is this really a story that we're evolving into a maritime innovation system? I, I think that's very astute and, and probably true. Um, I think when, uh, um, when uh, Q1 Labs and Radiant 6 happened, um, we were not getting these kinds of events in Halifax, for example which by sheer size and you would think would be, and I think um, New Brunswick at that period had the conditions, it had the connectors, it had a supportive government, it had taken a lead on some technology fronts that enabled. And so we should be thinking about that too. The big issue going forward for New Brunswick is the digital divide and the, um, and the, uh, and, and the internet, rural internet and rural broadband uh, to enable the kind of things because New Brunswick has a different kind of urban rural structure than uh, Halifax, which is, you know, very dominant in Nova Scotia. Um, here it's much more diffuse, uh, kind of interesting for that reason, but a bit more diffuse because of the three major cities and a lot of smaller cities that have a great deal of innovation in them. So I can't remember what the uh, original question was, but yes, I think we're looking at a more, maybe more of a regional model or a regional approach than we were before. And uh, and yes, yeah, so oh, I liked your one comment particularly about where a lot of the emphasis maybe is on marketing presentation um, and um, sales. Um, you know, I think uh, there are great developments going on, but with the uh, coming out of the COVID period and the kind of technological challenges, we've got uh, maybe more emphasis on uh, Presentation, marketing, sales, definitely. Uh, and another thing I, you know, it's often talked about, well, uh, you know, you're remote, um, you're, uh, you're already a remote area and now we're moving into a remote era in the interaction of business. And I wouldn't go too far down that road. I think that's a perilous assumption to make. I think we will return, we're gonna to return to a hybrid and where interpersonal is still very important, you're going to still have to worry about whether those air links are uh, still in place after the COVID goes. So, yeah. So I have a colleague in Ontario who uh, had read my 
commentary about your book. So he went out and bought a copy and we were talking about it the other day. And his question was coming from an Ottawa centric perspective is, it seems like the goalposts have shifted. He didn't seem impressed with an exit. What he was saying is mm -hmm. that success would be a company that stays and scales. And he gave the example of Shopify, Shopify. in particular. Yeah. And so the, you did a nice job in the book sort of talking about the thought processes of the founders around what they would need to do to make this successful. Could they do it from New Brunswick? What was the logic for exit? And I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on is New Brunswick or the Maritimes in a position uh, to get to that scale up and ongoing enterprise uh, territory? Or are we really looking at, in a sense, our market is the exits and we want to just keep recirculating uh, the wealth that's coming in so that we can create more ideas and more opportunities? Now, that's not a bad model. I mean, and, and there are people in the Maritimes and Atlantic Canada who argue that's a feasible model. And we keep building on that and building on it, uh, spiraling up till maybe we get a, um, a, a significant technology company that might go public. And of course, the great thing about public is you can do partial public offerings and you can maintain Canadian control. And I think for somebody, for some of the, the dreamers, when we talk about the geeks and the dreamers, the dreamers would say a great Atlantic Canada company uh, goes public, remains Canadian controlled, uh, is that possible? Of course, we know it's already happened. Um, uh, Verifin in uh, St. John's um, is now a billion dollar, at least before the pandemic, a uh, billion dollar, I think it still is, a billion dollar company by Canadians, by Canadian currency standards. And uh, so you have to look at that and say, yeah, that is, that's, it's, it's Canadian owned. It's based in Canada. It has a largely Canadian, and it's it's been and Shopify, of course, is the other great uh, great model. Shopify is public company. I wish I had bought shares in it. Um, Verifin has taken advantage of private equity. It's a much different market now, so you can avoid an exit much more easily than you could have uh, when these two New Brunswick companies uh, uh, exited. And they were companies that saw themselves as niche players in a hugely growing, two hugely growing areas where they couldn't help. They couldn't keep up really without some kind of strategic investor. And uh, they were very lucky that way. They found two of the best. So there's a bit of a what if element with Verifin as well. I think in the book you indicated that there might've been some interest in Verifin acquiring, I think it was Radian 6. Yeah, and or, or doing some kind of sure. agreement. So that leads to sort of a really big what if. What if it had been a acquisition by a Canadian Atlantic-based company? Do you think that we'd be looking at a very different region today if that had been the exit as opposed to with the big player in the United States? I think it could have been a big value creation uh, proposition in the Maritimes. Um, uh, but it's a, it, the what if propositions are always fraught, uh, of course, in all <laughs> kinds of circumstances. But there's the potential. I mean, uh, I mean, even if it, they'd created a bigger company, it was eventually sold. It would have created a lot of value in the Maritimes, even if it was eventually there was an exit, a larger exit. And I would say that didn't have to be. Private equity now um, uh, buys out other private equity. You get gradations of private equity. So private equity, uh, Verifin did a $515 million deal financing last year with its old private equity investor. They just leveraged up a bit. And um, I think we're into a new phase and maybe great better hope for, um, for Atlantic Canada than the old formula of venture capital, US venture capital investors, which was the situation that Brian Flood and his partners faced uh, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. That was probably the best option or the only option. Now, going back to the story, because it's a big story, like one of the most impressive parts of it was just how many players were involved, the moving parts, uh, the sequencing of how everything happened. And each time there seemed to be a new group coming in from the US, I sort of needed a scorecard to keep track of who was playing. So it got me wondering, because there's so many things that come up in the book, if you if you'd had more time <laughs> and you wanted to spend the rest of your life writing this book, are there certain 
dimensions of the book that you feel could warrant more attention, certain players, uh, certain parts of the story that have a little more richness that could be brought out? Uh, or is there a sequel? Uh, again, if there's budding business writers out there, what should they be looking at? Well, I, um, you know, I think the story from a, it is a story that's packed with people. And uh, um, I tried to juggle them as best I could. Uh, I don't think I could have brought another single person into that book <laughs> without my readers. My readers' heads would be exploding by the time <laughs> they read the book. But I would have liked to have gone to some of these other places in Canada with the book, as I'm doing now, and saying, what do you think? Could you have done this? Could we do this elsewhere? Because, uh, as you know, I make this kind of tremendous leap in the book to say, we've got to do something about the, the, the digital divide. And I'm looking at the digital wealth divide as well. And um, we're in a very dangerous era now where it's really too easy to leave certain regions behind. That's very bad for our country, very bad for our, uh, and yet there are, for, for our polity, it's bad for our, our, our social foundation. Uh, and yet we know there's innovation in these regions. It just needs the particular set of conditions that created the Q1 Labs and Radiant 6, supportive institutions, supportive governments, supportive colleges and universities, passionate connectors. So I wanted to, that's the part that I didn't talk, cover in the book. And, I, and maybe, maybe there's a potential to do that and to look at Canada and what the potential. I, I'm right here in Toronto and um, a few miles away is the Mars Discovery District. And um, I'd hate to think that that's the beginning and end of innovation in Canada and wealth creation out of innovation. Well, one hope I have for your book is the stereotype that I didn't believe was still in existence came a ringing through with a, a report and a commentary by Philip Cross with McDonald Laurier Institute, which suggested there are no innovators or entrepreneurs in the Maritimes and we lack the culture. And I did raise your book as a strong rebuttal to that perspective. And so part of the puzzle for me is where does that attitude come from, uh, from people just looking at numbers, let's say out of Ottawa or a think tank. And why is it important that we tell stories so that if we're not looking for means and middle observations, we're really looking for unicorns, which is the best thing that can happen. Uh, is this really an era where we need better reporting, better storytelling to get the information out? You know, I, I'm, I'm not going to boast, but I think I've spent a fair amount of my career trying to bring the stories um, outside, uh, outside the Golden Horseshoe, uh, from the stories of economic growth, of innovation, and um, um, I think every region of Canada needs these stories. Actually, stories are part of the conditions. And you need a you need some sense that you have an entrepreneurial. I know that's tough sometimes in this age where entrepreneurialism sometimes gets dismissed. Uh, um, but uh, at the same time, it, uh, the stories are important. Um, and you need the stories about Thunder Bay. You need the stories about uh, Prince George, BC, because they are great stories. They're human stories, but they're stories that really, that this can be told anywhere. These can be told anywhere. You can create it really in this age with the communication new technology we have, you can create this kind of value anywhere, but you do need the stories. People are motivated by stories. They're excited by stories. And in the maritime region, of course, we have wonderful from Atlantic Canada generally, wonderful models we've had um, we have a lot of great old family companies that somehow have sustained entrepreneurial magic right into third, second, third, fourth generation. And I think also we need to make a connection with those people and those stories and the new, the new generation. Well, an interesting link to those dynasties and ongoing is the players in your book who had all this success, there's almost an irrational attachment to New Brunswick that they, they wanted to make a go of it here and they came back, they started the next thing up here. And that's sort of not uh, growing up in Ontario, the model I grew up with, it was you're successful, you go to Toronto and there you will stay. And so 
we I wasn't used to this idea that someone would want to make such a strong go of it in their hometown. Well, you know, I, I covered this phenomenon with the Codfathers, uh, which I documented the family business. But I also looked at these oddballs who really did aviation acrobatics to keep on sort of this commuting life between their roots in Atlantic Canada and their jobs. <laughs> their soulless job, no, that's not true. Very good <laughs> jobs, very often, excellent jobs. But, you know, the life, the kind of rat race life they lived in. Uh, and uh, th there's something, I don't know, primordial, something basic uh, about Atlantic Canadians and their attachment. It's people have told me, and this people in other parts of uh, Canada have told me, it's, it's, it, it isn't really, um, there's no real comparison to anything else in Canada. This is so much an Atlantic Canada, and, and, and therefore it's kind of a secret strength too. So when the guys, the men and women from uh, Q1 Labs and Radiant 6 were able to flip it because they made money and because they did well and because they had roots and they had family, they said, I don't wanna go. I don't have to go. This is the first, ge first generation really, I think, of, um, uh, in, in Atlantic Canada of people who could get the next plane to Toronto who are saying, no, no, don't need to. I can do it here. That's great. Um, just noticing we're hitting the Q&A uh, time. I'm looking on the chat session to see if any are coming up. I can talk to Gordon all night if there's, uh, till we see some. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot in the book that I enjoyed reading and thinking about. Uh, well, I don't see one yet, so I'm going to, oh, here's one uh, from Gary Schley. Did the final book have the focus you expected, Gordon, or were there detours that meant abandoning parts of the original concept? Um, you know, a um, friend of mine, Gary, thanks for that. <laughs> um, the, uh, book, um, the book really did take on a different energy um, uh, after I got into it. I was approached to write this, not not by sponsors, but people who said this is a good idea, um, and we, you know, you should be able to find a publisher for this. And I thought, you know, I covered this as a reporter for the Golden Mail, uh, these two companies, in a story, uh, you know, about 11 years ago, 11, 12 years ago, and so I said, kind of narrow, you know, it's kind of like, you know, what is it, 20,000 words? Good magazine, good magazine article, I think I said, and then I started getting into it. And uh, I think the big part was discovering how, how interesting the lives and the roots of these young people were to get to this, where they came from. Um, they came out of the Miramichi, they came out of so, so various, uh, uh, in the middle of uh, New Brunswick, a place called Chipman, a uh, great place in the for forest right in the middle of New Brunswick. Uh, not, your not your predictable tech, uh, uh, techie, uh, tech Wunderkind. Uh, and uh, and then suddenly uh, the great stories and the fact that there were a lot of setbacks in their lives, not a lot, but a number that made these very human stories. So it became a much more human story. And um, therefore I had that problem <laughs> that, uh, that Herb identifies of having this cast of characters uh, with these great <laughs> human stories. I couldn't, I couldn't let go of any of them. I had to carry them right through the end of the book. But yeah, it, it definitely did take on more of a personal complexion. Than I oh, that's great. Just waiting to see if another question. Po oh, here we go. Uh, Brian Dunphy in the chat said, no face-to-face -face also opens opportunities that we've never had before. The positive is that the world is our marketplace and it forces entrepreneurs to think bigger. Yeah. So I would ask, what have you seen so far for innovation during the COVID era? And what are your thoughts on how we might benefit from these strange times? Uh, well, I think we can benefit from these strange times. I think, um, you know, I think it's, it's, uh, we're seeing a lot of innovation and we're seeing it in, in private and public sectors. I, I've identified with I work a lot with the University of Ontario in, in Ontario, and I, I think UAB would say, uh, while we lack the face-to-face um, -face 
and maybe some of the uh, some of the students are not there that we normally would. The um, really the world is our market now. Really, there's no there are no boundaries, and I think you could say that about any company. Um, that there are now no boundaries to where you can sell and where you can do your business. But as a friend of mine also says, you have no protected boundaries for yourself either. The rest of the world can come in. I think universities have a great opportunity uh, if, they're, uh, if they're good and they're and adroit and they're good marketers. But as Herb talked about earlier, marketing sales presentation, it, that becomes defining now rather than just stuff around the fringes. Uh, you know. We have a question from Chris Newton. Uh, oh my. Okay. Chris asks, hey, Gordon, how long did it take you to research this? How many conversations, trips, hours? Everyone I know, including myself, were blown away with the detail. Well, first, um, I got to thank Chris. Um, I was a little nervous uh, this, uh, that, um, that uh, Chris uh, might think that I was intruding too much in his life. And um, Chris is a wonderfully generous, and that turned out to be uh, most of the people. Now, there are also those people, uh, you know who you are, that did not answer my call. <laughs> and and uh, um, that happens in the book. So how many hours? I mean, it, I really started in a way um, um, researching this book years ago when I first did that Globe and Mail. I have a, a Globe and Mail article maybe 11 years ago. Um, I just kept my notes and uh, I kept looking back on it, and I kept my contact with, with Atlantic Canada. Uh, but then there was a final year and a half of real hard, bruising uh, work involved. And uh, how, how many interviews? I, I think I, in the preface, I have a list of many dozens of people I talked to, some by phone. And I, I just got to thank Chris Marcel and uh, David Alston, Chris Ramsey, um, Daniela DeGrasse for opening their lives to me and very generous. And I think, I think you could only really do this in Atlantic Canada too. There's an openness that um, is very refreshing. And uh, I think I was able to exploit it. So that leads to a, an interesting question that came in immediately after from John Weaver who uh, said, people can be wonderful storytellers. As an archives grubber, I have to ask, did you have access to correspondence or were there places where you would have wanted heaps of paper? Yeah, I don't think this, um, <laughs> that's a good question, John. And I don't think, uh, I don't think I spent a lot of time in the archives on these things, except for contextual. Uh, a lot of the stuff was face-to-face uh, -face interviews. And I think it's some, it reflects to a certain extent the time and place we did these, and the the, the uh, milieu that these young uh, tech people were were, were involved in. Um, for example, the incredible product that um, um, Radiant Six had for monitoring social media would have loved to uh, seen that in action more, but uh, time had moved on. So I did get some documentation around it that was very useful. Uh, I, I actually probably used documents more on trying to understand the technology and for burrowing deep uh, and relying on interviews and recollections from the people for the storytelling. So we have a question from Bob Skillen, who I still believe I owe a beer to, so I'd better ask this one well. Okay. Um, Bob asked, Gordon, Jerry Pond was woven through the book. What contribution do you believe he made to both Q1 and Radiant 6? Well, uh, with Q1, he was the credibility, the uh, the, the old pro uh, that could, they could bring into the company. 57-year-old old pro, by the way. Uh, he wasn't that old. Uh, but at the time, he had, he'd left. Uh, and remember, he had built um, NBTEL into a, uh, phone, a telephone company that punched far above its weight. It's, it's an icon in, in, in New Brunswick. And really, it, the whole story starts with Jerry's um, stewardship of NBTEL. So he's, um, he comes in that way. Um, and in, um, obviously, uh, he was ready to make a little investment to, as an angel investor in these areas. But he's a guy, I think, in both these cases, who pushes people a little farther to be better, uh, who is not necessarily a, a pushover, a guy who says, what's next? 
you really know what you're doing next. Um, and he can be a little edgy at times, uh, but extremely loyal. And uh, so he played a slightly different, he was much more of a, uh, he brought the people, uh, Radiant Six in a sense is that he brought a bunch of people together that he'd known through his long experience, both with NBTEL and in uh, particularly a company called iMagic. And he put them together with uh, Chris Newton. Jerry has this incredible ability just to see combinations and how they work. And again, it's that connector thing. Uh, he has an instinct for connecting. Um, I would hope that there will be more people in the province who can play that kind of role. It's great. Uh, Mary Jo Tebow's question is after publishing, what do you wish you would have included in the book? Um, well, I wish the people who, I wish I'd have gone harder at the people who never answered my calls, obviously. <clears throat> you know, I think I should have sat on some doorsteps for a while and do the good old reporter thing, you know, the Mike Wallace routine. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I now wish I had been more aggressive in going after some people who would have opened up corners of the book. But I'm pretty happy generally in the way the book, I had to actually leave out quite a bit, suspend a lot of my interviewing just because it was getting overwhelming. Um, um, I, um, you know, I, I, I tried again to follow up uh, in the book with what happened after. I found that a bit challenging, frankly, Mary Jo, uh, uh, because it's not linear. It's a lot of different stories that haven't come together yet. So those are some of my observation of what I would like to have seen. It's great. Uh, Nancy Mathis asked Gordon, you've written a lot about Atlantic Canada. Do you have a personal connection to the region or is there something unique here that causes you to cover our stories? Um, any was thoughts on that one? The region adopted me uh, basically. Uh, it's funny, uh, about 15, 20 years ago, a, a great publisher named Adam Porter phoned me up one day and said, I want you to do a, uh, a book on the Atlantic business elite. I said, Adam, I'm not from the Atlantic region. Uh, I, you know, and she said, no, that's why you've got to do it. You're the one who's got to do it. Uh, you'll come with a, a bit of an outsider's uh, uh, perspective. Um, you maybe uh, won't be afraid to tell some stories. And um, um, and I wrote the book called The Codfathers. And I think when you write a book on something that's kind of encyclopedic, as that book was, a number of biographies, people keep coming to you and saying, well, you, you know something about this subject. Would you like to do this and this and this? And I, after a while, I, I kept saying, no, no, I don't want to be typecast as the chronicler. Uh, so I had to do a Western book. And I had to do a telecom book. But I keep coming back. And frankly, what's better than traveling in Atlantic Canada in search of great stories. It's a dream project. Well, I'd like to say I'm grateful that you took the time to write Unicorn. It was a very, uh, it's a book I enjoyed reading and I definitely learned a lot. And as you can tell, I'd highly recommend anyone read the book, particularly if they're interested in innovation in an interesting place and thinking through some of the big questions about how can we make this happen again? Or what can we do to raise the odds? And mm -hmm. so, and I also thank you for a great conversation this evening. Uh, well, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you, Herb. It's always great to talk. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Herb and Gordon, uh, for a fascinating conversation. Uh, I, I think uh, some of us just wish it could have gone a little bit more lo longer. But if you uh, haven't read the book, I would encourage you to do so. Uh, there are lots of fascinating stories. And, uh, and I know that Gordon will actually be giving other talks in other locations. So if you want to join in, I'm sure that you'd be welcome to do so. I'm going to introduce Karina Lebdon and Nancy Mathis, who are going to talk to you a little bit about, uh, more about a continuing conversation series about some of the issues that, in fact, have been raised in this particular book. So over to you, Nancy and Karina. So now the big challenge is which of us is going to start? Karina, please. <laughs> Thanks, Nancy. Good evening, everybody. Thanks, Gordon and Herb, for that great conversation. I echo Herb's comments. I read the book um, 
And even though I know the story, um, there were so many little treasures to find as you read through all the chapters. So I appreciated it, the deep dive that you took and uh, the ability, like you said, of all the characters to open up to you. Maybe that's an Atlantic Canadian thing. So Nancy and I are super excited about taking the next step uh, with this conversation. So how cool is it that we can bring characters of this book to life? And so we are going to launch a three-part speaker series called the East Coast Unicorns, um, starting on November the 10th and running for three consecutive Tuesdays at noon. We're going to have a series of the characters come to life and talk to us a little bit about their stories so that we can continue Gordon's probe, which I think Herb referenced in his conversation about what is New Brunswick's secret sauce? What are those magical ingredients that you need in order to continue to have success in innovation? What has been happening since these really great exits? Um, we're gonna have a really great chat with some of the younger seeds uh, that have been planted because of the ripeness of our ecosystem. So I encourage you all to continue to join us um, for this series and this session, and you'll have another opportunity to engage uh, with Unicorn in the Woods and consequently the New Brunswick narrative uh, of positive storytelling around innovation. So how are you gonna do that? Maybe I'll pass it over to Nancy to say, how are we gonna continue to stay connected with you all? And connected is the key word, Karina. So Karina is going to facilitate the conversation and we're going to have a couple of people on each of the three calls. This will be done at noontime, so it's not interrupting your bedtime routine like this one is or getting into your work day. So we're hoping you will join us to do a deeper dive and a little bit of a spoiler alert. You would know this if you know Karina and I, there's going to be certainly the characters from the book, but we think there's an underpinning of how this happened uniquely in Atlanta, Canada and in New Brunswick related to the connector community. So Herb referenced it a few times and Gord referenced it a few times. We think there's rich ground here. So having that amazing creative environment and the technology that happened within the book, that's great. Sometimes it's challenging to think about the technology uh, requirement to have a unicorn. You can have that requirement met, but if you don't have the connectors in the ecosystem, we don't think you're going to pull it together. And so we're going to be examining that and taking a deeper dive into the role of connectors in an ecosystem so that hopefully it honestly doesn't need a billion dollars worth of exit to make really successful companies in this region. You just need people to network with one another and to have those, in Karina's words, collision that makes the magic. So in order to get in tune and in um, up on how we're gonna do this in the next month, as Karina said, it's gonna be running in the month of November. The promotion for this will happen not only on the Goose Lane uh, page, like you found out about this event tonight, but you can also go to the Facebook page of the Wallace, all pronounceable, all spellable, Wallace McCain Institute on Facebook and we'll post out all the information of, about how you will register for this event and tune in like you did tonight. So thanks everybody for involving Karina and I tonight to uh, promote this future tale to uh, the great work that's been done already. So thank you very much. And thank you all of us, all of you for joining us this evening. Uh, again, if you would like to obtain an autographed copy and one of the few autographed copies of the book, please contact Westminster Books at info at westminsterbooks.com or 1-800-561-7323. That's 7323. And don't forget to tune in to UMB's forthcoming In Conversation events. I'm sure they'll be illuminating and there may even be some connections. Thank you very much.